All right, guys, welcome. Today we have a special guest on Corolla. She's a scientist. She's been part of the community for a long time, and she's going to share one piece of advice that has really helped her along her weight loss journey. Um, but before we get started, we are in the six week summer intermittent fasting challenge. This is currently the third week that we just started today. So if you guys want to join in, it's not too late. We have like the $1,300 with the grand prizes, which are all amazing. We have the brand new six week summer meal plan. All those details are linked down description below. So if you want to join in, you can check that out. But today, oh, I just thought we have someone from Germany. Yeah, so is Corolla. Perfect. Um, all right. So before we dive in, if you guys want to let me know in the chat, what's your favorite meal? Because this is actually going to come into play with like the third thing we talk about. Um, but let me know in the chat what your absolute favorite meal ever is. So now we have Corolla. Corolla is an absolutely amazing human. She's a scientist. Um, she has made a lot of really great progress, but also found out how to make um, her lifestyle changes work for her life. So where she doesn't have to feel like she's restricting the types of foods she loves, she figures out how to be able to make those foods um, apply to the foods that she really likes. So today we have Corolla and I'll let her introduce herself a little bit better. Hi, Corolla. Hey. Hey, um, you want to tell everyone a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name is Carola, as Autumn said. I'm 35. Uh, I have a PhD in particle physics. And I used to work at the University of Toronto up until the end of last year uh, when I moved back to Germany. And now I'm actually in the industry. I have my first industry job. But up until last year, I worked in research, um, which is why I was so intrigued when I first stumbled about, uh, across Autumn's program, because combining like science and, and the things you eat was really interesting to me. And you do not find this in a lot of other programs. Like often you only have a meal plan or recipes or general like guidance but there's no explanation behind why you're supposed to do certain things. And that's something that I was really intrigued about when I stumbled across your, your program. Yeah, I remember that actually just brought up a memory from, I think it was like your initial, um, like when you had just sent in your story, you'd mentioned that you'd done a previous meal plan where it was like, eat one tablespoon of hummus at this meal. And you're like, why? <laughs> like, why am I doing it was eat five tablespoons of legumes, like lentils and, and chickpeas and stuff like that. And I remember actually starting to hate those types of food because I was like, I don't want to eat this. Why, why do I have to eat this? And it actually yeah. triggered really kind of a reaction of now I don't like this food anymore and I don't want to eat this at all because there yeah. was no explanation. I was like, why though? Yeah. Yeah. That was something that was always um, for me, at least in school with nutrition is felt like even in school, there's a lot of that where um, if you don't have that like basis, basic science understanding of the biochem, the physiology, the anatomy, you would then go into the higher level nutrition schooling um, programs and they would just be like, okay, like these guidelines and you're like, but where did that come from? Like, why is that the thing? Um, which actually leads us into your main piece of advice. And I think this is really important for all of us to understand because it can really help not just with achieving goals, but making it so that you feel comfortable with it and you can really wrap your head around it. But we have your main solid piece of advice here. Key to long-term success, find your level of scienciness, which is a word we're claiming it. Um, but tell us about what you mean by that. Yeah. So let me start with like one very big disclaimer, because I figured when I tried to talk about this with other friends, it's not that easy to talk about it without sounding arrogant. And so I, I just want to dis put this disclaimer out. Nothing I'm saying means that somebody is more or less intelligent than somebody else. It's literally only how you were trained, what your education is, what your expertise is in. Um, and this is, I think, something that is really important when you try and find information, for example, about how your diet supp is supposed to be. Because somebody like me that has a PhD and got trained in how data is collected, presented, and, and how you can read data in scientific papers will look at this data very differently than somebody without any scientific background. Yeah. And I mean, let's be honest, mathematics is not most people's favorite subject in school. Um, so if somebody sees a YouTube video by you, for example, and you talk about a certain study and then they look up that study and they try to read this paper, if they look at a plot and they see, let's say, error bars, but they have never been trained in how an error is calculated on a data point, then they might not get the information out of that that they actually need and that would be useful to them. 
Yeah. So by figuring out what your level of like scientific understanding is, it's way Science. easier than figure out what to where you to get your information from, right? Yeah. Um, and this is also why I think, for example, that your channel is really important because what people need to do is to find sources they trust that can bring it down to the level that they actually need. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say I'm a scientist and I'm really interested in all the background and all the details. Then if I see your video, I can look the study up. I can read it myself. I can like draw my own conclusions. But yeah. then still, I'm not an expert on like nutrition and I'm not an expert on anything like diet. Uh -huh. So I would still trust what you say in a video about the study while at the same time trying to understand as much as I can about it myself. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody else who has no scientific background, for example, might be perfectly fine just watching the video, see the broken down conclusion that you present to people because you are the expert in this field. So you can break it down to people and say, this is the main takeaway point you should get from this study. Or mm -hmm. if you want something like in, in between the two, then reading a couple of blog posts might be useful or reading just like an article in, in some scientific magazine. I mean, there are a lot of articles out there that cater to a more general audience and not ne necessarily just the scientific community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important because it will not help you to, to look at something that's too complicated for you to understand or just not you're not able to understand because you have not been trained in this field. While at the other hand, if you look at something that's very broken down and very simplified, it might not satisfy like your thirst for details if you do have a more scientific background. Yeah. And it helps you like when you even just from a, someone who doesn't have the background of like physiology, anatomy, biochem, all that, that we we're just talking about, um, you can at least still understand the basics of like how things are happening and even having that basic idea. Like you can understand, OK, in, this is what insulin does. You don't necessarily need to know how insulin is doing it. Like you don't need to know how insulin is created within the body or which organs are releasing or all of these various um, complicated matters. But even understanding like, OK, if your goal is weight loss, understanding these basic principles of how these different hormones are affecting the body and the hunger um, at that level of your understanding, that's that can help you to be able to inform your decisions on what meals you're going to be choosing without having to be stuck to eat five tablespoons of hummus at each meal. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's something we do in every field. When when I was still working in Toronto, for example, I sometimes gave lectures to high school kids and mm -hmm. I, I would tell them about like the, the studies and the, the science we do at the LHC in, in Geneva. And of course, I would not explain to them, oh, we have this proton and it does that. I, I basically told them, imagine oranges colliding and little like TVs flying out of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just you need to find yeah. a picture that you can convey to them to understand the basic points you want to convey. They don't have to understand all the mathematics behind it. And that's something yeah. that I think a lot of people do, no matter what their field of expertise is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's get into the actual reasonings for why this matters, um, because this is like the big idea. But this has a lot of trickle down effects on your goals, your progress, um, how you're going to feel, how confident you're going to be in the decisions you make. So let's go into the first one. So the first one that Kroll mentioned for why it's so important to find your level of scienciness is motivation. So tell us what you mean by that. Yeah. So as I briefly mentioned in the beginning, when I tried this, this other diet out in the past, I got really frustrated because I just didn't understand why I was supposed to eat certain things. And it's really hard to keep yourself motivated if, if you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. At least for me, I tend to then get kind of stubborn. I'm like, well, if I don't know why I'm supposed to be doing this, why am I even doing this in the first place? Mm -hmm. And you lose the motivation to keep to something. But if you understand why you're doing this, then also once you start seeing progress, you're like, oh, I, I understand why I'm seeing this progress. And that can be really motivating because mm -hmm. on the one hand, you're rewarding yourself by, oh, yeah, I got something. So I'm, I, I'm smart. I understood this. Yeah. And at the same time, you also see that you get the results that you expect, which then I think even gives you more motivation to keep going because mm -hmm. you do understand why you're doing it and you see the results and you basically just can like continue that path while you do this with the knowledge and the background. Yeah. And it also helps you to even be able to um, pinpoint what's working, because if you understand what it is that's supposed to be happening within the body with these, like what we always talk about on the channel or in the programs, like, OK, um, when you eat these certain types of foods, this is the expected outcome on how your body will be feeling. Then it makes it easier to understand, like, OK, 
this, this, um, the fact that I lost body fat percentage makes sense because I've been following this type of protocol that allows me to achieve these types of bodily functions within the body. Um, but what I've seen a lot of times as well with maybe people, uh, outside of like this community where we do talk about all of that more science back information, um, I've seen that people will often, even if they're seeing results, they will like quote, give up because mm -hmm even though they're seeing results, they don't know what is really causing those results or what's affecting those results to even be happening. And so it can feel like you just are stuck to that one specific way of doing things for life because you think like, well, this, this whole specific meal plan or this specific program is the only thing that's going to cause me to get these results. I don't know what's specifically causing it. Um, then it's, it makes it hard to feel like you can maintain that for life. Yeah. And, and also if the results are maybe not exactly as expected in the first place, because I mean, how many times have we read, for example, in the Facebook group that people are kind of frustrated, but at the same time excited because they yeah. do lose like inches around their waist, but they're not losing weight or they feel better. They feel more energetic, but the scale is not moving. And then understanding why this might be the case and why this might not be a bad thing is yeah. really important. Yeah. And also tweaking like little things. For example, I remember when, when I first started, I wasn't losing as much weight as I thought I would. And then I read at some, in, in some of the posts that, oh, you need to check how insulin sensitive you are, if you can keep milk products in or dairy products in or not. Mm -hmm. That actually made a difference. I was like, oh, great. So there's this one point that I wasn't like thinking about before, but now mm -hmm. I understand why my weight loss was the way it was before and why it's now different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, which kind of brings us into the second point, um, resistance against outside pressure. So just remember, guys, if you're just tuning in, um, Corolla's main piece of advice is finding a level of science-ness, the term. Uh, <laughs> and these are the reasons why it's so important. So the second one, resistance against outside pressure. So tell us a little bit about what you mean by that. Yeah. So the thing is, there are so many different diets out there and there is so much advice on how to do this or how to do that, that no matter where you will mention that you're following a specific diet, there will always be two people at least telling you that you're wrong. Like this cannot work for this and this reason. And when you tell somebody, for example, oh, I'm on a two meals per day structure or three meals per day structure, and it works really great for me and I have great results. There will always be somebody, oh, but I ate six meals a day, like very small portions, and, and that worked great. And like, yeah, that might work for you, but for me, this works. And I know yeah. this works for me because there is science behind that actually explains why this can work. And of course, there are other options. There are other studies that might tell somebody this can work for you as well. But if you do know that what you're doing has like a basis that is grounded in science, I feel it's easier to then say, yeah, I, you might have this opinion, but I know that this works for me. And I know that this is not some like mumbo jumbo that somebody just came up with and is working for a reason I don't understand. This actually has a basis. And yeah. that makes it, I think, makes it easier to then stick to it and not get kind of like defensive and be, oh, maybe I should change this mm -hmm. and maybe I should not follow this diet. Because if they say that this other thing that's completely the opposite works better, then maybe I should do that. And then people might not stick to the plan anymore. But if they understand that what they are doing, there's a reason for it. I think it's it's easier than to say, I do this because I know it's good for me and I know why it's good for me. Yeah, it's about understanding the mechanism, like how it's actually happening, um, which, you know, I love that people come to me for obviously for the advice or the tips or the strategies. But um, the reason why I always go through the details on why things are working, which I get sometimes people in comments who are like, you could have made this video like four minutes shorter if you just told us specifically what the tips are. But there's a reason why I'm telling you guys why these things are happening. Um, and it's so that you can actually have that confidence in your own decision making as well and being able to explain it to others. Because if you feel like you can explain it to others, then that means that you are you have some comprehension of what's actually happening. Maybe not to the degree of like a physiologist, a biochemist or whatever. Um, but you do have confidence in being able to understand what's happening, which is really important for that long term maintenance as well. Um, all right. So the third really important reason that Corolla mentioned, these are all Corolla's own pictures as well. Uh, but flexibility in your meal planning, which I honestly think this is all of these points are, are so important. But this is like such the um, such an important practical reason. So tell me a little bit more about why you said this. 
Yeah, I mean, just, just as you say, for practical reasons. Um, I mean, your programs are great and they have a lot of awesome recipes, but there are just so many of them. Yeah. So if you want to follow this, let's say your whole life, because you're happy with this way of eating, then at some point it might become repetitive if you just yeah. repeat the recipes exactly the way they are. Or, for example, you might not get a certain ingredient. Um, now that I moved back to Germany, I figured that a lot of the things I could easily find in Canada, I sometimes can't get here. Or I might have to wait because I have to order them online and then it takes a week or so for them to get delivered. So being flexible with the meals is really, really making it easier to sustain this long term. Because then you, if you understand, okay, this specific ingredient is in the recipe to provide me with a certain amount of protein or a certain amount of fat or whatever... Yeah. And you know what other ingredients might have the same amounts or similar enough amounts, then you can just swap out the part you don't get or maybe you just don't like the taste of or you just don't feel like eating that day. Yeah. Um, for example, I had days where it was cold outside and I was craving something like warm, but on the meal plan, it would say tell, tell me to eat something like a smoothie or whatever. Yeah. And then it'd be like, well, I can just replace it with this other meal that will have the same effect as the one that was supposed to be in the plan for today. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also about adjusting it to your individual food preferences or if you're traveling or if you ne can't necessarily um, be cooking your meals or you don't want to be cooking your meals. That's a, another big reason why the why is so important, because if you, again, just have to stick to a specific meal plan where they tell you specifically what to eat, um, it doesn't really allow for you to ever get creative with what you want in that moment. Um, there's a lot of times where I might plan for a meal. And I don't really feel like it <laughs> at that particular dinner. Um, so I'll still take a lot of the similar ingredients and transform it into something entirely different, but knowing that it's still going to support me feeling great. Um, so it's having that flexibility or even when you're going out to eat, that's that's one thing Krill and I are actually just talking about this um, before we signed on, but going out to eat is a big part of just culture now. Like I, a lot of people are going out to eat now. And although I cook most of my meals at home, I even still go out to eat at least once or twice a week. Um, so being able to know that you can go out to eat and still feel really great and being able to eat meals that you like that are still tasty is also an important um, aspect for that long term success and being able to stick to something for the long term. Yeah. Uh, would you say like when you went out to eat that that was also something you experienced? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you if you can maybe bring up the slide again, I can uh, use the picture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, because so the, the, the rightmost one and the middle one are meals that I cooked and the left was uh, left one is one when I went out to eat um, and we had breakfast there and I saw that there was this plate that basically had scrambled eggs and a bunch of like different cold cuts and a small portion of Greek yogurt with some blueberries and I basically thought oh well this is perfect because it has all the things that I would usually put into my morning meal um, it has the fat and protein and whatnot what I need and of course, I would not order this with like, I don't know, French croissants or bread in this case, but just eat it the way it is on the plate. Um, but this way, I can still enjoy my breakfast with friends at the restaurant uh, and still know that this is perfectly fine for me to eat. There's nothing that I wouldn't eat for my normal breakfast anyway. Um, yeah. And then the same if you go out for dinner time, you can just like scan the, the menu, look for things that are already like nearly perfect fit. And then you might just have small, some small adjustments, ask them to leave something off or replace something. And I mean, most of the times restaurants are very flexible nowadays. So if you just say, hey, can you like skip the bun, give me a lettuce wrap or whatever, it's usually not a big problem. So as long as you know what you would like to have in your meal and what should be taken out, you can go to restaurants and just adjust the meals to your liking. Yeah, that's one thing that I do quite a bit with my clients where if they have like specific restaurants. I think we all have like three restaurants that we go to all the time. Um, we had my husband and I live in like a area where we have a ton of restaurants available to us. And yet we still go to like the same three restaurants every single weekend. Uh, but knowing like on that menu, you know, what it is that will actually be supportive of your goals and seeing how it can actually be really delicious. Like that is really important for that long term maintenance as well. Um, any anything else you wanted to touch on with this slide before we move on? No. Okay. So guys, I'm going to, I have a couple more things I wanted to go over in this live stream, but before we move on, if you guys want to put some of your questions in the chat and maybe Carol can give some of her advice or um, I can answer some, just throw them in the chat. And it's easiest if you put like the four question marks before and after easier for us to find them. Uh, but before we move on to the questions, Carol, is there anything you feel like as maybe is, I'm just like, 
throwing this on you right now. Sorry. Uh, is there anything that as like a beginner, someone who maybe isn't an actual scientist um, for helping them to find their level of scienceiness and how they can actually start their whole journey? Well, what, what type of advice would you give them? I, I think the main point is to look at the info that's out there. For example, watch one of your videos, read a blog post and just try to assess, are you understanding the information that's in there? And if not, what is the part that you don't understand? And if there are specific things you don't understand, then to find kind of a support group that can explain this to you. For example, one of the great places for this is the a and Facebook group where you can always put your questions because there will be a, a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds and different levels of like how long have they been doing this, how many information, how much information have they collected over the time. And there will always be somebody that can help you and break it down or t point you to the next source that can explain this a bit better. So just find people that can actually answer your questions and figure out what those questions are first, of course. Yeah. And always just thinking about like going back to the why, like why is it that this is happening? And if you feel like you can't understand that even to some um, very simple level, then, you know, that's that's where you need, you know, you need to maybe dive a little bit deeper. Um, obviously, on my YouTube channel, blog posts, programs, that's the whole point um, of what we do is try and make sure that you can actually understand the why. But always asking yourself if you actually understand why this is happening. And if not, know that now it might be a little time for binging some videos. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So I think I see some questions there. Um, but for anyone just tuning in, uh, we are in the third week of the six week summer intermittent fasting challenge. If you guys want to join in? Definitely not too late. Um, you can oh, just realize I don't have the slide. <laughs> uh, you can join us and we still have like a solid over three weeks left. So um, we have an amazing group of people who are all part of this community like Corolla, um, but also literally like 15,000 plus more people, too, from all different backgrounds. Um, so if you guys want to join in, details are in the link down description below. But let's get into some questions. OK, I think I saw one about travel. Yeah. So just brought it up here. Any suggestions for traveling? Cruel, you, do you have any suggestions for traveling? So one thing I usually always make sure when, when I know I will be traveling is that I, I pack a bit of food for myself beforehand and ideally food that can last a bit longer. So I always have a couple of nuts with me, um, depending on how warm it is when you're traveling, maybe a bit of cheese or, or sausages or something like that. Um, and then the other thing is to already look ahead where you're going. What is what are the food options there? Like, are you going to a different country where you might not be familiar with with the way they cook at all or what they put in specific dishes? Then you might want to do some research ahead of time, figuring out what things are actually safe for you to eat. If you're just traveling to like the next city over, just pack your own lunch and have a look at potential restaurants you might go to because then you can already make sure that they will have something for you to eat. So for example, we, we flew to Chicago um, a couple of years ago and I ahead of time looked up the restaurants that they told me, hey, this is the place we might go to just to make sure that I don't show up there. And then I'm kind of sad because nothing on the menu would actually fit my diet. Mm -hmm. um, and usually people are also happy to then look for other places. If you say like, hey guys, I'm, I'm really sorry, but this restaurant just says nothing for me on the menu. Can mm -hmm. we maybe think about something else? So just plan ahead and make sure that you do look for options for you, what you can actually do and eat. Yeah, I would, I would also say um, assessing what your means of travel is, is a big one. So if you are traveling by car where you can bring a little cooler or something, that's going to be different than if you're traveling by plane where you can't have any liquids. So like if you're traveling by car and if you do really like having something like smoothies, you could lend up a smoothie, put it in the thermos and you don't even have to worry about anything else. Um, but if you're traveling by plane, obviously you can't bring a liquid smoothie on. You can't even bring yogurt on, which I actually learned that the hard way is really upsetting. <laughs> um, it, apparently it's like too like lobular or something, not, maybe not the most appealing word. Uh, but pro tip, you can't bring yogurt on a plane. Um, but there are different options that you can bring on a plane like jerky or like cheese or, you know, some of those more non-perishable items, especially something like jerky or meat sticks, et cetera. So knowing your means of travel and making sure that you also are um, accounting for that, because of course there is once you get there, like the tips that Corolla was just saying, but I think that's also something that we kind of forget sometimes is how we're actually getting to the destination. Okay. Great tips. I saw some other questions on here. Juliana, 
how do you go about portion sizes of meals? So do you want to give your input on that, Corolla? Sure. I, I, to be honest, I think this is kind of a journey because in the beginning, you might want to stick with simply the portion sizes that are suggested in recipes. Mm -hmm. But especially over time and on the long term, I don't think that's actually sustainable because you always have to adjust it to your own physique, to your own plan. For example, I usually go with a two meal structure. So sticking to the portion size in a recipe would give me way too little nutrition over the day because I would be missing out on a whole meal. Um, so I personally don't really look at portion sizes at all anymore. I just eat until I'm satiated because I know from experience that my body is quite good in telling me when I actually had enough food. Just make sure that you eat slow enough so that your stomach actually has time to tell your brain you're full now. Um, mm -hmm. And then usually your body will let you know when you're done. But if you feel insecure, then I would say stick to the portion sizes that are in a plan or try to figure out if you only have a two meal structure, for example, what should I be getting in terms of like protein, fat or even calories? If that's your thing and you want to look at them, sure. But on the long run, I think you will figure out for yourself how much you actually need. And then that's also the thing. If you understand, OK, I should get at least this amount of protein, fat and fiber, then the portion sizes kind of logically follow this. Because if you know you have two meals, you need this in both meals, then you can just figure out how much you should have in each of them. Yeah. And one thing that you said there that I think might seem a little confusing for people, especially because you are a scientist, where you just said your body will tell you when you need to stop. That doesn't necessarily for most people sound like very sciencey. But I think when you approach it from a science backed um, method, like where we talk about the satiety hormones, that something something like being intuitive about actually knowing how much your body needs does come naturally, where you are still applying a science backed method of understanding these are the effects that you should be having by having certain types of um, foods within your meal, then you can actually have that more intuitive nature where if we just approach the, like, I know there's like the intuitive eating general trend um, where you just eat, but you don't really know why you're eating certain things. Maybe you're just eating them because you do crave them. Then we can fall into the issues of just falling cravings. And that's, that's something different. But when you actually know that you're adding in the types of foods that support the way that you want to be feeling, that can allow you to be intuitive with more of a science-backed method. But, but that's also why it's important, as you say, to understand the background, because there are a lot of studies, for example, that stay, tell you that eating a certain amount of protein will you tell your body you're full. So yeah. you might be eating a full meal that just doesn't contain much protein, and you, you're kind of confused why you eat and eat and eat, and you're just not getting satisfied at all, and you still like crave food. Because yeah. you did not understand the scientific background that would have told you, well, yeah, you because you need protein in order to feel satiated. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is kind of intuitive, but it is backed by science. But you need to understand the science in order to know what has to be in your meal in order yeah. to apply this. And that that circles back entirely to Cruel's main advice of like understanding the science first, even just if it is very, very simplistic. Um having some type of understanding of the why can help to dictate your future meals and meal decisions and lifestyle decisions as well. That'll make you feel great. Um, I think I had something else to say, but then I totally lost track because you had that amazing last piece that you said there. <laughs> um, all right. So we have actually a lot of questions. Courtney here, any advice for aging women? I'm 47, take really good care of myself, but feel my body isn't as responsive as it once was and wants to hold on to weight. Uh, from again, from more of a science back, like it, when we're actually looking at what's happening as we age, insulin resistance does increase. So by having the understanding, like what, again, Carol was talking about understanding the why and the science, um, understanding that as we age, insulin resistance does increase will help us to dictate how we're actually going to change our meals as we age. A couple of other things that also happen as we age is that we do have increased bone loss and increased muscle loss. So protein needs tend to go up. So balancing out, making sure that you are addressing the insulin resistance, which really comes down to carbohydrate sensitivity and making sure you're eating according to that um, and making sure you're eating enough protein for your body's needs, that can really help to break through a plateau, especially as we age. And I know that is a big concern, but uh, I mean, Corolla could probably attest to, especially lately in the Facebook group, there's been so many women in their 50s, 60s, and even 70s who have completely broken through their plateau have totally like changed their relationship with food and really are loving what they're eating. 
um, all by addressing like this why and the science behind it and making their meals reflect that. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Carla? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm 35, so I'm not yeah. at that point, but I can already say when, when I started with the program, um, that was about two years ago, I think, yeah. uh, I lost around 55 pounds in a bit more than half a year, I think. Um, and since moving back to Germany and I mean, life gets in the way, I, I gained about 20 ish of them back. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've started now to incorporate all the, the rules and the diet back into my life. And even if it's just like, it's just two years, but I can already see that it's taking a bit longer than it did the first time. Mm -hmm. So I think your body just changes all the time when you're aging and you just have to adjust it. And sometimes you just need to give yourself a little bit like slack and just say, okay, this might take longer, but I'm mm -hmm. still getting where I want to get. It might just take a while to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, definitely making sure that you are being kind to yourself during that process is really important because it doesn't help anyone to be beating yourself up. But knowing that you're actually applying the principles that also will work for where your body's at now is also important. Um, our bodies are changing all the time, whether or not it has to do with age. You know, there's even if we have increased or decreased our activity level, not even just from a pure calorie perspective, but the fact that when we increase muscle mass, it increases our um, our uh, carbohydrate sensitivity. Sorry, there's a carb honking outside. <laughs> totally distracted me. Um, it increases or decreases our carbohydrate sensitivity, makes it so that we can handle carbohydrates better, but it increases our protein needs. So that's where even increasing your eating window can be important. And, you know, just making sure that you're never just applying what worked for you in the past, but looking at where your body is now. And when you have that understanding of the why of the science, even at a very basic level, it can be easy to help make those just slight tweaks that can make all the difference. And if you haven't seen in the new uh, six week summer meal plan, definitely recommend you check it out. I can't recall what page it is specifically right now, but there is a section on protein age related needs. That's a really, really important one that I've seen make a huge difference for a lot of women, especially about 50 or older. Um, so you'll, you'll definitely want to check that page out. That's a uh, link down description below. Okay. Here's one on, actually you might, you might have some good insight on this Corolla. So, um, not necessarily about kids, but a hectic schedule. Like how do you, how do you handle like a hectic schedule? Well, what I used to do when I had weeks coming ahead where I knew I would have a lot of like meetings or a conference or whatever, and I wouldn't have time to cook meal prep is really the key like try to find the one day during the week maybe when while your kids are at their sports uh events or whatever where you can take some time to actually prep a meal and then maybe freeze some portion of it or, or freeze them in bags and just like open them up one by one over the week to just decrease the stress on the days where you don't have time and push it towards the one day or a couple of hours on a specific day that you do have um, that usually helps a lot. So yes, I know it's really annoying sometimes to plan ahead and to figure out what do I want to eat in the, in a week from now. Yeah. And you might sometimes end up with meals you do not want to eat that specific day, but at least you will still have a meal that satisfies you and that still keeps you full. So yeah. planning ahead and scheduling out when you can actually prepare the meals usually helps a lot with that. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that help with a lot of um, my clients as well. For myself personally, my schedule can be a little crazy all over the place as well. Um, but for for myself personally, I've never been like a meal prepper. I, I don't really like to. I And I bring this up just because I want to show that there are multiple solutions to this type of um, problem. But if you love to meal prep, that's a great option, obviously, because you can have that meal done and ready and it's good to go. For myself personally, if I know I will not have time, I focus on meals that have pre-cooked proteins and maybe don't require um, any type of cooking. So I'm a big fan of rotisserie chicken, canned tuna, like all those things where the protein is already cooked because you could literally like just throw that together with some high quality um, like Dijon mayo, make a, a chicken salad and you're done. Like you can make it really simple uh, and not even require taking out like a pan to cook in. So it's also just being, if you aren't a meal prepper, if that's not something that interest you knowing that there's the pre-cooked protein options and being familiar with the different types of meals that you can make with that is also really helpful. Which also comes back to the adjusting your, your meals tip, because I remember at some point I shared um, a tip in the Facebook group 
that for one of the recipes, I think it was the pesto avo wrap, like a yeah. coconut wrap, that you can basically take a pre-made uh, Caesar salad and just like drop mm -hmm. it in there, put the pesto on instead of the dressing that comes with this, mm -hmm. skip the croutons, and, you, and you're good to go. And yes. as you said, it has the pre-cooked rotisserie chicken in there, there's salad in there, you exactly. have all the things you want without having to actually prepare them. You don't have to chop the salad, you don't have to like cut up the, the tomatoes or whatever. Exactly. It's already there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people hear um, like the, cause that is almost like a form of prep, even just intentionally going to the grocery store, knowing that I'm going to be getting this pre-made thing instead of um, cooking it myself, you're still prepping. Maybe you're not literally chopping the food yourself, but you're prepping for the week ahead, knowing that it is going to be busy. And that can be so helpful too. It's just finding, just like finding your degree of scienceiness, finding your degree of the meal preppiness that works for you. Um, all right. So Holly, this might be a good one for you as well, Corolla. Um, I love healthy soups, chilies, stews, but I always seem to want to pair it with grilled cheese slash bread. Any suggested healthier substitutes that will not totally throw me off track? Well, I mean, as you have maybe seen in some of the pictures that came up today, cheese can actually, especially grilled cheese, can be a great option. Um, I used halloumi a lot of times on my meals as a quick and easy source of like fat and protein because it's two or three minutes top to just fry it off in the pan. It stays fresh in the fridge forever. It feels like it's like a couple of months usually. Um, you can always have it handy when you need it. And it gives you that satisfaction if you are craving just like grilled cheese because yes, it's not a grilled cheese sandwich, but it's still cheese and it's grilled. So it's kind of technically a grilled cheese, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and for something like bread, if you understand, okay, I just need to find a substitute that works for me, then you can look into different options that there are for like kind of fake breads or bread alternatives and mm -hmm. figure out which ones work for you because there might be people that can buy like the off the shelf keto breads or, or high protein yeah. breads. Some that are a bit more insulin sensitive might not feel good with them. But you can basically then figure out what does work for you and find substitutes that do yeah. still like help with those cravings. Yeah. One that I recently found, because although there are like these um, low carb bread options that if you just absolutely can't live without bread, it's still going to be a better option if you are more carbohydrate sensitive um, than just regular bread. But they tend to just be made out of like wheat gluten and, you know, a lot of other ingredients that I'm not particularly a fan of for long-term use, but still better options than just regular bread. Um, however, if you are open to trying out some different types of options, one that I've recently found, I've posted about on my Instagram quite a bit. I think I even talked about it on YouTube before, but it's called Outer Isle. I'm not sure if it's available everywhere, but it's the one cauliflower like bread option that I've seen that is actually fantastic. A lot of the other cauliflower bread options or like tortilla options, um, uh, not tortilla, because I love Nuco as well. Um, but like the more bready sensation where Nuco is not as like bready. A lot of them still have like cassava flour, tapioca starch. Um, but Outer Isle, that one is just made out of Parmesan eggs and cauliflower. And it still has like that bready consistency. So yeah, you can check those out. Um, or if you just really feel like you need to have something that's maybe a little more similar to bread, then at least having some of those options like what Corolla just mentioned are good too. And or don't knock it till you've tried it. The halloumi, like grilled halloumi actually is amazing. I know in the US, like I wasn't really exposed to it until I visited Greece and I like fell in love with it. And it's very simple to make and it's amazing. Right, girl? Yes. <laughs> And, and, and also bread options. Like I, I remember one time I tried, I mean, it was supposed to become bread rolls. It was more like a flat bread in the end, but it was basically just cheese and I think almond flour and an egg or something like that. It, it was very simple yeah. and it turned out like the perfect sandwich bread in the end. Yes, it was not what I was thinking it would become, but it was still pretty bready and it was really, really tasty. I mean, it was basically cheese, yeah. cheese and bread form. So that was perfect. Um, and I, I just love to use that with a lot of then fresh veggies in, in the middle. So it's not too heavy, yeah. but there are a lot of recipes out there. So just try all of them, figure out which ones you like, because especially with a lot of the like bread replacements, a lot of them might taste a bit too eggy for some people. Mm -hmm. But if you just yeah try recipe after recipe, you will find the one that you really like. At least most of the time I figured that people found one recipe and they were like, yeah, that, that's it. That's yeah. the one I'm now using if I want something bread like. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. A couple more questions here. 
Uh, a quick one. Layla is asking about the yogurt. Have you made the yogurt, by the way? I can't remember. No, not really, because I usually always had access to pretty yeah. great Greek yogurt, so I never saw the need to make it myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I know that for a lot of people, the whole reason why I came out with that Greek yogurt video is a lot of people don't even have access to um, like a full fat Greek yogurt option. It's usually a zero fat option. Uh, I love it because it literally saves me like $600 a year at this point by making my own because I use so much Greek yogurt. But anyway, Layla is asking about the homemade yogurt process. I followed the formula exactly, but it's not coming out anymore. Um, I would check the yogurt starter that you're using. It could just be that the yogurt starter actually died and there's not actually an active bacteria in there. If it's, if it's not, if it's literally not fermenting anymore, that's probably what's happening. So you could even just go to the grocery store, grab, grab a whatever, even if it is a zero um, fat Greek yogurt and try using that as your new base um, that can help to re-inoculate it and get some fresh bacteria in there to actually get it going. Uh, okay. Any Karen, did you really experience bloating much Corolla? Not really. I, I was also trying to think if I ever had that before starting with like intermittent fasting yeah. and low carb, but I don't really think that I ever suffered from this. So unfortunately, I can't really say anything about that. To be honest. That, was, that was honestly my biggest issue um, before I had used intermittent fasting. That was one of the main reasons why I first started using intermittent fasting was because my bloating was so bad. I've talked about this a lot where I would have to like lay on the ground after every single meal because my stomach would hurt and be so distended. Um, but seriously, like we're talking intermittent fasting, the, one of the biggest things you can do for helping to, um, get your gut actually cleaning itself again, we have internal processes within our body where it's supposed to be flushing out food and bacteria that would cause bloating. We just need to make sure it allows time for it to be turned on. Um, so if you have, if you're new to my channel, make sure that you, I have a lot of videos specifically on bloating. You could just search like Autumn Bates bloating on YouTube and those will pop right up. Uh, otherwise, obviously the intermittent fasting programs that you can check out on my website at autumnlnutrition.com. Um, but intermittent fasting has been a huge game changer for me and I never get bloated anymore. If I get bloated, it's because I know that I did something and ate something that would make me bloated. But other than that, I never get bloated anymore. Okay. Um, there's a lot of questions. So let's just stick to like one or two marks. I know that you, you probably have to go eat Corolla. <laughs> it's like, uh, what time is it? Oh, six, uh, four, seven, four, seven, seven. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, let me see. Oh, here's a really, really good one. Frida, what kind of job do you do Corolla? So she probably just tuned in. Um, does your LC lifestyle, lower carbohydrate lifestyle isolate you from coworkers and how about meeting friends? How does that work for you? Um, well, I just started a new job in February and since we're at the moment still everybody's in home office, so I haven't actually met a lot of my coworkers, so I can only talk from like past experiences, which also it's a bit difficult since I started during COVID. <laughs> so, so mm -hmm. most of the time I was actually working from home. I used to work as um, a researcher uh, at the University of Toronto for about four to five years. Uh, now I'm a project manager in a semiconductor industry. So uh, we basically make like little microchips for cars. Um, and I'm mainly working a desk job now. So I'm planning budgets, timelines, things like that. Um, it is a bit difficult. I found now that when I do go to the office and they want to go to the canteen, for example, like our canteen doesn't really have anything I can eat. Um, but what I usually then do is to just bring my own lunch. And usually it's not an issue if you just sit down with people having your own lunch. At a restaurant, that might be difficult. Um, but we're quite lucky. We have a very nice like sunroof where we can sit and eat. So people will just pick up their food at different places anywhere, uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I can just bring my own lunch, store it in the fridge, and then get it out when everybody goes to eat. Um, otherwise... The only thing that I found working was to look at the one thing maybe that is on the menu wherever you go with your co-workers or just ask them if they would be willing to go to a different place or to like switch it up from week to week. And then in the weeks where they go somewhere where you will definitely not find something, then maybe just excuse yourself for that one day. They will usually not be mad at you, right? Um, and just eat something else somewhere else. I mean, yeah. This, if you haven't, um, Frida, if you didn't check out last week's live stream with Katie, she talks a lot about this on how she kind of uh, deals with these social situations. A lot of really helpful tips on that one. So you can check that out. It was just from last Tuesday, actually, because of the holiday. Uh, but something, you know, 
like it, it might surprise you how easy it can be to make a lot of meals work at pretty much every restaurant. It is very rare that I've seen that there's literally a restaurant that just will not work. Even at a pizza restaurant, usually there's an appetizer that's like meatballs. So there's always going to be, for the most part, um, something that can you know work with your goal so you don't have to feel like you're isolated and you can't be part of the group um, going out to eat if, if that's the situation. Well, one thing that works really great for me is that a lot of the times you will have some like meat, veggie, and then some carb thing uh, on the side if you just ask them to take away the carb portion and put double the veggies they will be happy to do that because for them most of the time price wise it doesn't make a huge difference if there's like rice or pasta on the plate or a bit more of the veggies yeah. so just ask them to double the veggies take off the rice or whatever would be on the side and you're good to go right right um jody says i have five packs of halloumi in the fridge now <laughs> <laughs> it's like if you guys have not tried halloumi Seriously, game changer. It's amazing. Um, okay, let me see if there's like one more question for today that's a little different from what we've been talking about. Oh, thanks, Katie. Katie said age-related protein needs is on page 17 of the new six week meal plan. Thank you very much. <laughs> um uh, okay. This one, a little different, but what are your thoughts about alternate day fasting in combo with training and food requirements? I personally don't recommend alternate day fasting. Um, you know, I know that's something that, especially in the intermittent fasting community, a lot of people like to have those full fasting days. I found for the goals that most people have, it's actually not very supportive of long-term goals. And that's what I'm a big fan of is that it's actually looking at um, supporting the body for the long-term. The thing that, especially as, you know, that we have to consider. And this goes back to the why of what Corolla was talking about and understanding um, how the body works, even to a small degree. Our body needs a certain amount of certain foods every single day, certain nutrients every single day. And it's really hard to make those up if you are going every other day without eating. That's where, you know, the studies that have been done on women not responding well to fasting usually are on more extended fast or like alternate day fasting because you're going a full 24 hours without eating. And women are particularly sensitive to that state of semi-starvation and not getting enough nutrients for the body's needs. So I'm a big fan of actually using a type of fasting that can support gut health, support um, body recomposition while still getting in all of your nutrient needs every single day. Um, that is really important for a spec. I, I feel like this is something that we've been talking about a lot and I feel like a broken record, but especially the protein component, um, I think that's been underemphasized for especially women, it's seen a lot in the body building community, but we forget that just in general, for general health, that is something we need a certain amount of every single day for not just muscle mass, but for bone density, which is a big problem, osteoporosis as we age, or even during the weight loss process, if that is your goal, it's a common problem to experience bone loss um, when you're uh, losing weight, if you're not also addressing the protein component. So kind of like a, a long way of answering this, but I personally do not recommend alternate day fasting. I know there's some people who have found success with it, but I have not seen it to be a good solution for the long term. I don't know if this is something that you've had much experience with, Corolla, but I would never really tried. I think I tried it for one or two days and I figured that I don't sleep well if I'm hungry. And so I was immediately thinking this this is out of the book for me. Like now I <laughs> if I have to go to bed hungry, I'm really cranky and I don't like that yeah so going a full day without eating nope <laughs> not for yeah. me yeah and you know i think um especially with just general diet culture we often think like more is better like if you can um, exercise more if you can fast longer then it's going to help you achieve your goals maybe in the short term because you're in a state of semi-starvation but not for the long term because the body does need that balance of fasting and eating we do need both so it's just, you know, always keep that in mind. Um, again, having that understanding of how this, how the body works, that level of scienciness and knowing that, yes, fasting has a lot of really great perks, um, even just that short term fasting, even if you're just fasting 12 or 14 hours a day, that has a lot of really great study perks. But so does eating like eating is also very important for the body. Um, all right. So thank you so much. Corolla for joining us today. That was really helpful. And I feel like um, that this is not something we've talked exclusively as much about, but I think it's really important that people hear and understand. Well, thanks for having me. Always glad yeah. to come on here.
Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be joining. Um, we'll have another live stream next week, next Monday, 9 a.m. PST. Uh, I also am thinking about uh, doing like, like maybe not this next live stream, but the live stream after that, um, doing like a review of some of the subscribers meal plans or like what you eat in a day. And we can like go through that. I don't know if you guys are interested in that, but if you are uh, comment on this video after, I might do like a poll in the community as well to see if that's something you guys are interested in. Um, but I thought it'd be fun. But yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, Corolla. And I'll see you guys soon.